I'm very excited to introduce to you guys. Um, her name, as many people know, is Jessica Lewis. Um, so she, in a moment, is going to be upgraded uh, to panelists so that she, we can see her on the screen. Uh, but while that is happening, I am going to uh, read her lovely introduction. Um, there's so much on it, but we tried to, to narrow it down a little bit. Hi, Jessica, I see you up now. Uh, so Jessica was born in Bermuda on April 3rd, 1993, only weighing uh, three pounds, eight ounces and was uh, diagnosed with a disability, a uh, diastomelia, a disorder in which a bone pierced her spine and split, uh, split it, leaving her paralyzed from the waist down. Jessica got involved with wheelchair track racing in 2006 when her late coach, Ken Tom, and his son, Curtis Tom, came to Bermuda to showcase the sport at a Adaptive Sports Expo hosted by Windreach Bermuda. Um, she started to compete internationally in 2010 since then, she has represented Bermuda at two Paralympic Games, London 2012 and Rio 2016. And I'm pretty sure she was supposed to be in uh, Tokyo, but uh, we'll, we'll see when that happens. Um, she is uh, the first wheelchair track racer in Bermuda and has won three Parapan American Game gold medals and one silver medal between Toronto 2015 and Lima, Peru 2019 Parapan American Games. She is also currently the reigning Parapan American Games record holder in the T53 100 meter event. Jessica has also won a bronze medal in T53 100 meter event at the Doha 2015 World Para Athletics Championships. After finishing fourth in the world in the T53 100 meter event in Dubai in the 2019 Para, uh, World Para Athletics Championships, Jessica has secured her spot to compete at the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games, which has been rescheduled. Um, Jessica was also named as Bermuda's Senior Female Athlete of the Year for the 2019 competitive season by the government and Bermuda's Department of Youth, Sport and Recreation. Outside of racing, Jessica graduated from Brock University to 20, in 2018 with an honors bachelor's degree in recreation and leisure studies focusing on therapeutic recreation. She has also obtained her certified therapeutic recreation specialist certification. Um, if you're just joining us for Jessica's presentation, please note that if you are here for your continuing education credits, um, we will be giving a co-word uh, later on in the presentation. Um, you can send that to us at windreach at windreach.bm with your name and profession in order to um, get those uh, CEU credits um, or certificates sent back to you. With that, I am going to pass it over to Jessica, who you're going to share your screen to show your presentation. Yes? Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to come off. No need to see me for, for a little bit. <laughs> there we go. All right, I hope that everybody can see it here. All right. Um, well, first off, I just wanted to wish everybody a very happy International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Thank you so much to Windreach for everything that you do for our community here in Bermuda. And thank you so much for hosting this wonderful conference um, and for creating this platform where we can have these important conversations uh, so that we can move towards a more inclusive world. It's definitely an honor to be a part of the day. And thank you so much to all of the presentations that have already happened and for sharing your knowledge and experiences. Um, so I thought I would just start off by giving just a little bit of a background on who I am and my disability, um, because I think it's important to know um, that as a person with a physical disability who was actually born with her condition, um, a lot of my experiences may be a little bit different to um, other people with disabilities who maybe have acquired their, um, their disability later on in life. Um, and I also wanted to give a little bit of background on my connection to Windreach. I know that Alyssa did touch on that, um, but I thought I would do a little bit more uh, in depth. Um, so the disability that I was born with is called diastematomyelia, and it kind of falls under the umbrella of spina bifida. Um, it is a rare form of spina bifida, and what happened was I had a bone pierce the bottom of my spine, which split my 
my spine in half, and that left me paralyzed from the waist down, um, requiring a wheelchair for mobility full time. Um, and when I was first born, um, I did have a little bit of movement in my legs, but that started to deteriorate when I was two months old. Uh, and that's when they found the bone spur. Um, so I've been in a wheelchair since I was 19 months old, as you can see in the picture there. Um, so my connection with Windreach, um, I started attending Windreach when I was five years old. Um, and I started at what used to be called Bermuda Riding for the Disabled, which now falls under um, Windreach Bermuda as a whole and is their therapeutic riding program now. Um, and uh, I kind of grew up through the organization getting involved in a lot of different sports, such as basketball, tennis, um, bocce ball, anything um, that they offered, I was there to try it. <laughs> um, and I've also been a camp counselor at their uh, summer camps um, for a few summers. And as Alyssa said, um, my athletic career started with Windreach as well, when they brought down um, Ken Tom, who was my previous coach, who unfortunately passed away in 2017, um, as well as his son, Curtis Tom, who is a racer for Canada, um, who now has retired um, and has stepped in to be my new coach. Um, so I owe a lot to each, um, you know, they showed me that having a disability wasn't a bad thing. And they introduced me to people who were like me, who were going through kind of the similar challenges that I was and kind of leading a similar lifestyle. Um, so for that, I'm forever grateful. Um, so let's move on to what we will be talking about, or I'll be talking about today, as well as um, questions and discussion at the end. Um, so I will be talking about how disability is represented in the media and its impact on inclusion and equality. So the media has a huge influence on probably every single aspect of our lives even if we hate to admit how much it does impact us. Um, it influences our decisions. It influences how we perceive or we think about different situations and even different groups of people. And the media um, has that big of an impact because it finds stories um, about people or about different situations um, that move us. And oftentimes it's done in two um, polar opposite ways. Um, the first being that it moves us to tears where we need to pity the situation um, and make a change in that sense, or it does the total opposite and it instills happiness and hope. And that when they do it that way, um, the goal is to inspire us to become motivated to make a change in ourselves or maybe even a change in the world as a whole. And a lot of the times these things are done kind of subtly, um, but they do have a very um, big impact and can be quite harmful. Um, so I do believe that there are changes that are being made, um, but I still feel that there are um, a lot of ways that we can improve and move forward um, so that we're not perpetuating, you know, a world of exclusion and misinformation. The language that, you know, we, we use um, either in the media or even just when we're speaking um, is so important as well. Um, so uh, one thing I did want to note here also is that you might notice throughout the presentation, um, a lot of the photos that I'm using are of people who are in wheelchairs or people who have um, Down syndrome. And I will tell you that I have done that absolutely deliberately. Um, when I was doing my research for this presentation and searching for images of people with disabilities and searching for articles and, and different things, um, these are what came up as if no other form of disability exists. So that definitely plays quite well into you know, showing how poorly the entire disabled community is summed up in the media. Okay, so I'll go to the next slide here. So I will um, talk now about a few just general examples on how um, 
disability is seen in the media. So a lot of the times when there is um, a person in a wheelchair on the screen, um, they are sitting in um, what I call an old fashioned hospital uh, style wheelchair. Um, now I do understand there are people that still use this form of a wheelchair, um, but it, it definitely does not represent the entire spectrum of um, the different styles of wheelchairs that are out there, as well as the amazing technology that has come about um, since, you know, in the, even in the past few years, just how much it's grown. Um, you know, there's wheels out there now that for people that have a hard time gripping the rim to push, they can just tap the rim and it moves the chair forward. Um, so there's a very severe lack in representation on um, what equipment is is being currently used. Um, another thing that I have here is um, that a lot of the times when a person with a disability or character uh, of a person with a disability is seen in TV shows or in movies, they're often played by um, actors who are actually able-bodied. Um, so there is, again, a real um, severe lack in representation on that side. Another one I have here is the photo um, is a man pushing his wheelchair and a woman next to him carrying some shopping bags. And to me, this represents kind of society's view that, um, you know, people who are in a relationship with somebody with a disability um, that is an able-bodied person, um, a lot of the times they're seen as more of a caregiving role versus as a romantic partner. Um, and then even more recently, um, here on the right of your screen, uh, there is a tweet from the Paralympic Games that talks about um, the new movie that Anne Hathaway is starring in. Um, and she plays the character of the Grand High Witch. And this character was created as only having three fingers on each hand, which portrays someone who has a limb difference as scary or a witch and someone who should be feared. And to me, having this tweet from the Paralympic Games just means the world to me that they they thought it was important enough to call out, uh, you know, this this um, experience and this movie. And um, I know that Anne Hathaway um, as well has posted an apology, um, but it's definitely, you know, it's 2020, we should kind of know a little bit better by now on how we should represent people and, and different characters. Um, but now all those are kind of just the general ways. Um, I'm going to focus more today on um, how people with disabilities are seen as either, as either tragic, where they need our pity, um, or they're seen as an inspiration for just doing kind of everyday um, normal activities. Um, so I think here, um, before I get into tragedy, we're going to have our first poll. Um, so if that can be uploaded. So the first poll is um, two questions. Um, the first one is, can you recall a time when someone with a disability was shown on social media in a tragic or uncomfortable or inspirational way? Uh, and the second question, have you watched the TED Talk by Stella Young? I'm not your inspiration, thank you very much. I'll give a few seconds for that to come in. I think it's done, I'm not too sure. <laughs> So if you, we have about 33070 uh, people have um, put in their responses. Um, so if you would like to add your response, you can add it now, maybe the next uh, 15 seconds or so. Um, so whether you have seen people portrayed in either a tragic or uncomfortably inspirational way, or if you've heard or watched the Stella Young uh, TED Talk. So Tina, I'll get you to go ahead and end the polling and then if you can share those results. 
Jessica, can you see the results? Yep. Okay, if you want, you want to speak to them? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, um, it's great to see that um, kind of people have seen, or most people have seen um, disability portrayed in both ways. So it'll, it'll make a little bit easier to um, follow along with what I'm gonna be talking about, um, but you still may even learn something. Um, and then for the Stella Young, that's awesome that not a lot of people have seen it because I will be talking about it. Um, so you'll learn a little bit more there as well. Alrighty. So um, I will jump in here to talking about disability portrayed as tragic. So when I was doing the research um, for this section um, on Google, um, I looked up images of people um, with disabilities and kind of at the top where you can get your additional, um, I guess, suggestions on expanding your search. The first thing that came up was sad. Now, to me, that speaks absolute volumes. It's perpetuating the myth that people with disabilities are sad all the time because of uh, their disability. And the other photos um, that I have here, on the top here, on the top left, is a girl sitting in a wheelchair and a man is holding her hand, giving her some moral support. And to me, that just shows that um, people with disabilities are seen as always needing somebody there to support them, somebody there to always cheer them up or um, just be there for emotional support. And while I do understand, um, you know, there, there are things that we do need support with, um, this is not always the case. And the other uh, picture I have here is when the man is sitting in the wheelchair and the girl is sitting on the couch looking very upset and very worried, just shows to me that a lot of people who are interacting with people with disabilities are always stressed out or they're always worried. And that's definitely not the case. But these are the images that were being shown by the media and even on Google. These are the first images that come up. And to me, that's, that's very upsetting and, and something that needs to be changed. And I'm not sure if anyone has seen recently, um, but there is a surge in what is called promposals. Um, and that's kind of where high school students are asking people to go to prom with them as their date in very extreme and extravagant ways. And, um, but the ones that are truly being shown in the media are ones that are able-bodied individuals asking people with disabilities to the prom. And as you can see here on the left, I have a article title um, called Girl Asks Special Needs Boy to Prom. A very special prom proposal took place at Matawan Regional High School in this beautiful video from littlethings.com. Now, to me, when I, I was watching this video and I was reading this article, it definitely portrays the person um, who is able-bodied as kind of a hero, as the person who is saving the person with a disability from not going to prom um, or maybe not being asked to prom. And just the language that's being used is very harmful and it, and it plays towards um, you know, boosting the morale of the able-bodied individual. Um, and there was another one that I found, um, which was um, actually two people with Down syndrome. Um, They're in a relationship and the, um, the guy was asking his girlfriend to the prom and it was using the heading on the article was a heartwarming video captures successful proposal between two students with Down syndrome. As if watching these two individuals who are just fulfilling the normal teenage role and expectation once finishing high school to attend their prom is extraordinary. And the word heartwarming is used just because they have a disability. And that's something that is definitely perpetuating, you know, that uh, individuals with disabilities are just there for you to watch and to kind of gain something um, yourself from them and maybe even to pity them because they, they're um, living with a disability. 
And a lot of the other articles that I read too, um, that portray people with disabilities in a tragic light also use words or phrases such as suffers from, a victim of, confined to, which all provoke pity and tragedy and feelings that the people are hopeless or they're brought down by their disability. And now, because I talked about how the media influences our lives, um, I think it's really important for me to share kind of my life experiences um, with, with being seen as a person that needs to be pitied, um, because that's all stemming from how people are seen in the media and how you know most people are interacting with people with disabilities. So I've had a lot of experiences where people will tell me um, that they want to pray for me or with me to be healed as if I'm a person that's broken. Um, I have been told that I will be forgiven of my sin for not being able to walk. And there's so many times that people say, I feel so sorry for you having to live your life in that wheelchair. And one of the biggest things that I really want to see change is that I have um, you know, a lot of kids coming up to me and asking me questions about my disability, which I am all for, but before I can answer them, their parents are pulling them away from me. And that just perpetuates that you know, interacting with a person with a disability isn't okay to do, or you should be afraid to do it. And I think if the parents allow their kids to interact with people with disabilities and to ask their questions about disability, they can become better informed. And, you know, the next generation, uh, we will start to see a normalization of disability and getting rid of all those negative stereotypes that people with disabilities need to be pitied or we can't be um, open to having those discussions. I found this on the web. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I will go into the next slide. Siri's trying to help me with my presentation here. Um, so one of the articles that I read um, here is um, called On Screen and On Stage Disability continues to be depicted in outdated and cliched ways. And in this article, they talked about four different ways that disability is still being represented. Um, this article did focus mainly on in plays or in movies. And um, one such way that people are being portrayed is what they call the redemptive narrative, which suggests that the characters in movies or plays that have a disability are never the main character, but instead they play as a stepping stone to assist the protagonist to reach a certain goal, often done through committing suicide or being killed. They are not shown as a person who deserves their own stories. But then in contrast, there is also movies that show the person with the disability as the main character, but the the plot still follows a tragic narrative where the person with a disability tries to gain back some dignity and humanity after acquiring their disability. And when that fails, the result is that the individual is still being killed off or choosing euthanasia. Now here I have um, an example of one such movie. Um, and I will admit that I have seen this movie. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody else um, has seen it, but if you have not, um, I'll just give a quick synopsis of, of it um, so you can kind of get an understanding of um, where I'm coming from when talking about this. So um, in the movie, the man is named Will, and he is involved in a terrible accident that leaves him as a quadriplegic. So that's all four limbs being affected. And he is not able to. Um, do a lot for himself, um, and he is paralyzed from the chest down. And then the girl, uh, Louise, is just recently lost her job, and she was looking for a job, and takes one as his caregiver. Now, Will is portrayed as someone who is very depressed all the time, and who sees 
nothing good in the world anymore now that he has a disability. And here, I do want to say that I know um, people who have acquired disabilities do often go through, um, you know, a phase where they don't want to, um, or they're not happy with, with what's happened to them, and they are depressed. So that, yes, I understand fully, um, is oftentimes the case. But the way that Will portrays it, it represents kind of everybody with a disability because everybody groups people with a disability into one category. So it definitely lacks the um, wide range of, of disability and the experiences. So through the movie, um, they end up falling in love. But despite that, Will is still shown to be very depressed and he ends up euthanizing himself. And he, he does leave some money for Louise um, in his will um, to help her fulfill some of the life dreams and goals that she has. So even though Louise is trying to show him that he can create a great life for himself, he still chooses to euthanize himself. Um, and these movies, to me, are simply saying that people with disabilities are just there to be pitied and they will be better off and maybe even able-bodied individuals would be better off if they were to just um, die. And it says that people with disabilities lives do not matter. And one of the other articles I read here um, talked about, um, I'm not a thing to be pitied, the disability backlash against me before you. And in this, uh, I'll read a quote from them which says, but the screen time granted to these stories to the exclusion of more diverse representations of disability has helped plant in the public consciousness the notion that life is worthless when it resides in a disabled body. And to me, this is, this is really upsetting as well because that's how a lot of, or the majority of um, everyday people are seeing people with disabilities. You know, especially here in Bermuda, our community is so small and not a lot of the, a lot of the time we're not out in the community where you can, you know, see us and interact with us. Um, so when we're shown these kind of images and movies, um, that's what we base all people with disabilities on. Um, so that's about um, tragedy. I'm going to jump now into talking about how um, people with disabilities are portrayed as an inspiration. So as an elite level athlete, um, having something that inspires you or motivates you is something that I am all for. It is something that I need to do or find in my life in order to keep me moving forward and keep me training when times are getting tough especially this year, um, not having any competitions that I was in this year um, was extremely tough for me to continue training and, and finding that motivation, as well as being away from my teammates. But the way that the word inspiration is being used in, in relation to people with disabilities is very, very wrong, and it's very, very harmful. And it's basically using people with disabilities um, who are just leading their everyday life. So here I have some photos of some of the examples that I've found um, that portray um, kind of the inspiration side of disability. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is on the right, and it says, never ignore somebody with a disability. You don't realize how much they can inspire you. And again, this speaks absolute volumes. To me, this says that the only person or the only thing a person with a disability is good for is to inspire you. It says to me that it's okay to ignore a person with a disability until you need some form of inspiration. And the other pictures I have here too are uh, a young boy who is in a wheelchair um, holding a basketball and has the quote, your use, your excuse is invalid. 
And the other picture is a young man who is an amputee and is swimming. And the quote next to him is, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. Now, I will admit that I am guilty of um, you know, using some of these images in past presentations that I've given. Um, but I've really learned now how harmful they can be to people with disabilities and how they are perceived in the world. Um, and the articles, um, I think I have it at the top there. I talked about um, the quote there. Let me just see what the quote was again. Um, it reduces people with disabilities to their disability. And that is so accurate. When you look at these images, they're there to show what a disability is. And it's all that that person is, is, is. Um, I always say that there's a thousand and one things that make up who I am and my disability is just one of them. But these images are there just showing that this is a person with a disability who is here to inspire you. Now, a lot of the articles that I uh, read um, that talked about um, inspiration and how, or the inspirational narrative um, is a quote here. In the inspirational narratives, disability is not a fact of life, a difference, but it's something that one has to overcome to gain rightful sense of belonging in society. And that is so true. There's so many people out there that talk about how disability needs to be overcome in order for the person to be able to lead a successful life. And I will admit too, I've used that language that I had to overcome my disability or accept that my life was going to have a disability. Um, but now I'm kind of seeing the way that that perpetuates the stigma that a disability is a bad thing, which it definitely is not. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, and in the article as well, it talked about how these, sto these stories center on disabled people accomplishing, accomplishing basic tasks or overcoming their disability. And again, that speaks absolute volumes, that we need to overcome our disability in order to be accepted by society. So. Um, the next slide, I will be talking about Stella Young, who was a um, activist, and she did a TED Talk in 2014 called I Am Not Your Inspiration. Thank you very much. And it's, it's good to know that um, not a lot of people have seen this, um, this TED Talk. So during this, um, ooh, jumping ahead of myself here. Here we go. Um, in her speech, um, she talks about how someone in her community wanted to nominate her for a Community Achievement Award, which was solely just based on the fact that she had a disability because she had not achieved anything else outside of just being a person with a disability. And she also um, was, in, uh, was a teacher um, and she talked about her experience um, when she was teaching one day, a young student raised his hand and asked when she was going to start her inspirational speech. And that was because um, he's, or he said that um, whenever someone in a wheelchair came to their school, it was always there to provide some form of an inspirational talk or motivational speech. He was very surprised to know that she was actually um, his teacher. And she says that, you know, that's not his fault because that's how a lot of people are interacting with people with disabilities because we're not out there um, or the population isn't as big as able-bodied individuals. So a lot of people don't even have interactions with people with disabilities. And the only time that he did was when, she, when they were a form or an object of inspiration. Um, and she also talks about um, how the media and um, society is perpetuating a lie that disability is a bad thing and that living with it 
makes someone absolutely exceptional. And she says, it's not a bad thing and it does not make you exceptional. Now the pictures that I had on this slide uh, previously um, with the quotations are some that she actually put up in her presentation as well. Um, and she kind of revolutionized the way that inspiration and disability was seen, in my opinion at least, um, because she came up with the phrase called inspiration porn. Now these, uh, this phrase was used to describe these pictures that, which I had shown in the previous slide. Um, uh, yeah, so the quote here from her is that, and these images, there are lots of them out there, they are what we call inspiration porn. And I use the term porn deliberately because they objectify one group of people for the benefit of another group of people. So in this case, we're objectifying disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. And she says that people can look at these images and say, however bad my life is, it could be worse. I could be that person living with a disability. But she questions people to think about what if you are that person? What, are you, what if you are that person with a disability and that's how your life is being perceived? How, um, how just having a disability makes you or puts you into a separate category than human being. Now here I'll also give some examples um, from my life um, on things that I've heard in relation to being an inspiration to somebody. Um, a lot of the times when I'm at the grocery store, I'll hear, it's so wonderful to see you out and about doing things. It's so wonderful to see you out at the grocery store getting things for yourself. That's so inspiring. Good for you for getting out of your house today. That inspires me. And it's usually accompanied by a pat on the back or my knee, or I've even had a pat on my head. And um, to me, that needs to be changed. It needs to be changed. Um, so the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about how the impact of being seen as an object of pity or an object of inspiration impacts um, not only people with disabilities, but just moving towards a more inclusive world. Um, so like I had said a little bit earlier, um, having these portrayals in the media puts people with disabilities into other categories than a human being. And it kind of sets a little bit of a low bar on how um, people with disabilities lives should be led. Um, and I find that having that and kind of dissociating a person with a disability as a human being allows people to feel that they can speak to us in any way that they like and that we're just supposed to accept that and accept that we have even been acknowledged. And that's why I gave a lot of my life experiences of the things that people have said to me. And a lot of the time when I do hear those things, I call the person out and I say, what you just said to me, would you say that to someone who is an able-bodied individual? And a lot of the times people say, no, I would never say that to somebody that's an able-bodied person. So it's because of these portrayals that people are feeling comfortable to say those things to somebody with a disability. And having the word inspiration thrown around all the time with people with disabilities actually neglects to acknowledge the actual incredible things that people with disabilities are achieving. You know, like we have here just recently, a 21 year old man has made history as the first person with Down syndrome to complete an Ironman triathlon. Now I'm an elite level athlete and I couldn't even think about doing an Ironman. That's just another level of, you know, competitive drive and, and spirit. And that is what should be the true inspiration for people is that 
he is achieving something that is extraordinary. It's not, he's not an inspiration just because he goes to the grocery store. Um, and another way that it's being impacted is that people with disabilities voices are not being heard. There is absolutely no focus in the media on issues that people with disabilities are actually facing, such as environmental ones, like ac um, accessible access, which we were just talking about. And when we try to, or when we, sorry, when we move towards um, actually portraying disability or the actual issues that we're being um, faced with, then we will move towards a more inclusive world. And people with disabilities are not being taken seriously. And that's something that needs to be changed as well. And as someone, um, speaking for myself, as someone who was born with my disability, this is my normal. I know nothing else. You know, it's my normal to get up in the morning and to get into my wheelchair instead of standing up to move. And this is my life. This is the way that I'm living it. And I don't need to be pitied and I don't need to be your source of inform or, uh, inspiration because I was able to get out of bed. Um, so uh, the next slide I have here is um, talking about just some ways that I think will help us move towards a more inclusive world. Um, so the first one I talk about is about norm normalizing disability. Proper representation matters. Outside of being a tragedy or inspiration, because that's not what we're all good for. Another way is that we need to start including people with disabilities in every single aspect of decision making. We need to start speaking with people with disabilities and not just advocating for them. And that's something I think that is a little bit later on today as well, which is awesome. Um, you know, people with disabilities, we deserve the same level of respect as an able-bodied individual. And this includes having more people with disabilities represented in the media by actual people who have disabilities. And another way is about being aware of the language that we're using when we're talking to and about people with disabilities. And this isn't just people um, who are in the media, you know, it's everyday people and how we are, um, you know, interacting with people with disabilities or how we're talking about them. Um, so that's all I had. And then I thought we could open it up to some questions and discussion. All right, Jessica, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you wanna uh, finish sharing your screen, that way we can see us a little bit better. We did have some questions already um, in our chat, okay. uh, so we will address those. And lots of you are amazing. Um, this has changed um, the way I see things. Lots of comments that way. So Jessica, that was fabulous. Um, so the one question that we did have come in, I want to make sure that I ask it specifically, was from Karen Simmons. Um, do you think that you have been, in, have been or are invited to speak to groups um, because you're primarily there because of your difference of ability and for inspiration. Um, do you feel that by doing this, you are being objectified or pitied? How can we change this narrative? Yeah, um, so one of the big things that I do is um, I do go into a lot of schools and I, I talk about, you know, my experience living with a disability as well as, um, you know, my journey in wheelchair track racing. So I'm of two minds. <laughs> um, I absolutely love doing that because I love you know, meeting, um, meeting other people and really putting out there that people with disabilities can lead successful lives and to have those conversations, especially with kids, so that they're kind of getting it from the source um, and, and kind of knowing my personal experiences um, living with a disability so we can get, like I talked about, that accurate representation of what disability actually is and how it impacts people's lives. Um, 
I don't think I've ever felt that I was pitied in those situations, um, but definitely um, for inspiration. Um, but I tried to kind of um, do my presentation in a way that the inspiration comes from being an athlete, not just a person with a disability. Yeah, yeah and I definitely have to say, I know when we, we were first discussing this, um, we were talking about the fact that in, in my mind, you're not, you know, amazing because of you, the, who you physically are, but you are amazing because you're a Paralympic athlete. <laughs> yeah. Um, and have, you know, the drive and determination to be, to be a high level athlete is something that can be, it should be inspirational. And, and I think that's where you um, drive a lot of that from. I did appreciate though, Jessica, within your presentation, um, you really touched on how this has been a journey for you. Um, that it's taken a little bit of, of unlearning. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you could kind of chat about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, like, like I said um, at the beginning of the presentation, I really wanted to let you know that my experience as a person with a physical disability that was born with it is a lot different than a lot of other uh, individuals with different types of dis disabilities. So even for me, having um, you know the experience to interact with somebody else, I'm learning from them all the time on, you know, what challenges they're actually facing and how um, their, their form of disability is portrayed in the media or how um, people are interacting with them based on their form of disability. Um, so it's definitely always, um, you know, room for improvement and room to, to learn about different people. And, and um, that's why it's, I love that, you know, you guys are hosting this with a, an array of, of people with different forms of disability so that we can kind of get a more diverse look at it. Yeah, and I, I feel like a lot of the times, you know, people, it's almost that, that tokenism sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Of, okay, we have one person representing a whole people group that is you know diverse in so yeah. many different ways and and they you know a group like that cannot be represented by one person on your committee or your um your class etc they shouldn't be the person answering all the questions on behalf of um, yeah. those with a disability whatever that might be Definitely. um i just want to say thank you so much jessica if there are any other questions um if you could kind of shoot those into either the q a or the chat in the next few moments, if you have any other thoughts in case those are coming in, Jessica. Yep. Mostly you're just getting lots of praise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you're also nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, but I, I really truly appreciate, you know, having this platform that we can have these conversations and, and start moving towards a more inclusive world and, and learning more about people and um, you know, one of the things that I always say, and um, this might be leading a little bit more to the inspiration side, um, is that, you know, we're all different and that's something that's so incredible. And that's what's gonna make the world go around and, and um, you know, make, make the world a better place. And when we're open to learning about different people, um, you know, you become a better person as well. Um, and you know, it's always a journey on, on learning and, and improving. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to jump to uh, a comment that someone's made um, yeah. about that uh, not every person with disability has uh, your degree of acceptance of their disability and not everyone is willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, when my kids are uh, have curiosity and questions for someone with a disability, um, I, I redirect them unless an individual speaks up and says a line of questioning is fine. Um, so she's kind of, they're kind of speaking to, you know, that, that asking you questions, whether that's okay or not. Um, and again, I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of those with disabilities, but for you, what is the best way for um, parents to approach that as far as, you know, making sure that their kids, if they do ask questions, how can that be done in a respectful way? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I think, um, like you said, there are people that are going through that that challenge of of not wanting their disability. And even myself, I I went through that um, as a kid when I was you know in school and I was the only person with a disability there. Um, and just trying to um, you know find my way in the world and find the way that I could live my life sitting in my wheelchair. 
Um, and for kids, you know, it's so important because they, they don't really see differences or they see them, but they want to know why. And I think when you're in a situation like that and the person with a disability doesn't want to talk about it, um, I think maybe that's when you can have a conversation with your kids afterwards saying, you know, there, there are um, people with disabilities um, are not in one certain category. You know, there are people who go through different life experiences, just like how we all go through different life experiences and how um, because of that, we still need to be able to respect them and see them as a human being and not be afraid to talk to someone else um, with a disability because their experience will be different. The one last comment that I'm seeing here, uh, someone uh, agrees with you and thinks that uh, the label of changing the label from disabled to differently abled, they really appreciate that that's how you yeah. approach it. Yeah, for sure. And even, even that, um, you know, people with disabilities, um, there is a contradiction on using that as well. But for, mm -hmm. for me personally, I, I like using it um, differently abled. Um, but a lot of people see that as, um, you know, not wanting to accept that disability is a thing or accept that um, disability is not a bad thing. And to me, that's not what I was trying to accomplish. Um, I just see it as that each individual needs to be seen for what they are capable of doing, not what they're not able to do. Definitely. I know the, the concept of labels is a huge topic that we could have gone into for hours. So we'll, we're going to put that one to the side. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to say thank you so much, Jessica. I uh, really appreciate all of your hard work and your, the information that you've brought to the table. I hope that everyone checks out that Stella Young um, yeah. TED Talk. It's amazing. I've seen it a few times yeah. and I love being reminded of you know, the important stuff that she, that she has to say. Um, on the topic and I appreciate that you bringing light to that topic as well for us. Um, if you have joined us today, um, any of our attendees in order to gain um, uh, continuing education credits, the code word for uh, Jessica's hour is Paisley. So Paisley is one of our sheep here at Windreach. Um, so you can send an email to windreach at windreach.bm with that code word, which is Paisley, your name and your profession by the end of the day. Again, if you're here for a few hours or a few different sessions, you're welcome to send one email um, with all of the code words that you have um, access today. Um, I wanna give a, another shout out to Everest Re for their generous donation that has allowed us to um, have this session today. I appreciate everyone who has been in attendance. We have about six minutes until uh, the next session is about to start. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll um, shift gears uh, to get that ready. And now is a great time if you uh, need to, you know, head to the washroom, grab a bite to eat and uh, come back to your computer. We'll be ready and waiting for you here at 12 noon. So again, thank you so much, Jessica, and I hope you stick around. Yes, definitely. Thank you.